Well, we've already had a message. I'm sure there's an unsaved one present here tonight that you heard the gospel. That song. I just can't tell you how I feel tonight. My mind goes back to this pastor of yours and his work in Melbourne. And to the great meeting we held there and the wonderful opportunity we had of proclaiming God's message. And how I thank God for the way of the truth gripped him, revolutionized his ministry, so that he has accomplished something here in Australia for missions that very few churches have accomplished. And I thank God for the way his people have given, for the wonderful, wonderful response that he has had, for the fact that he is sending out missionaries, that he's giving to missions, that he's interested in world evangelization. There isn't anything else like it. I'm giving all my time these days in the United States and Canada to missionary conventions. I'm traveling continuously all over America holding missionary conventions. As soon as I get back after concluding these meetings in Australia, I'll be leaving for Texas and then for California and other states to hold other missionary conventions that have been booked, that are being prepared at this present time. There's nothing near my heart Nothing that interests me like missions. It's more far-reaching than any other kind of ministry. I thank God for evangelism. I praise God for direct soul winning. But I believe that missionary conventions and missionary work, missionary meetings, I believe they're far more reaching than any kind of evangelism because they go on and on and reach life after life transform lives, revive churches. I've seen churches revived as a result of holding missionary conventions. And I know of no quicker way to get a revival in any church than to get the people interested in missions. Then there's real revival. Revival with an outreach, doing something for others. So I thank God for your pastor. Thank God for his invitation. Thank God for his work and his vision and for the privilege that is mine in of standing in his pulpit once again. It's a wonderful honor, wonderful privilege, and I'm very, very grateful for it. I trust that God will bless his work here in Adelaide, just as he blessed it in Melbourne, and that you too may forge ahead in a great missionary endeavor and reach those with the gospel that have never been reached before. Now, if I were to take a text tonight, I return to the gospel according to Mark, the 13th chapter, the 10th verse. The gospel, the gospel must, the gospel must first, the gospel must first be published. The gospel must first be published among all nations. I wish I could spend half an hour on each one of those statements. Each statement is of paramount importance. But I'm only going to be able to deal with one statement. As a matter of fact, I'm going to deal with just one word. And that one word is the word published. And I'm going to interpret it literally. The gospel must first be published among all nations. I cannot believe for one single moment that it's God's plan that you and I should have the printed page in our language. 500 different versions of it in the English language, while 2,000 nations, 2,000 tribes, do not have one single verse of it in any one of their languages tonight. I say I do not believe that can be God's plan. What does the book say? Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing how? Hearing by the word of God. I believe God is going to reach the rest of the world by the very same method he has used, used to reach you and me. Why are you a Christian? How is it that you're saved? What is the explanation? There is only one explanation. The only reason that you're a Christian tonight is because you've had the book. If you hadn't had the book, you wouldn't be a Christian tonight. The only reason that you are a Christian is because you've had the book. 
You've had the printed page. How can you expect those in other countries to become Christians if they do not have the book, if they do not have the message? If faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What was it that gave us a reformation? You say it is Martin Luther's preaching. I do not believe it was. I do not believe the preaching of Martin Luther would ever have produced the Reformation. Martin Luther was very limited in his preaching opportunities. But Martin Luther wrote nearly 100 books. He scattered those books throughout the length and breadth of Western Europe. As a result of the writings of Martin Luther, there came the Reformation. Not the preaching of Martin Luther, but the writings of Martin Luther. The pen is mightier than the voice. That's why I'm concentrating these days on my books, on my writing ministry. I know that I'm accomplishing infinitely more through my writings than I am through my preaching, because the pen is mightier than the voice. Do you know the greatest miracle in this our day and generation? I believe the very greatest miracle today is the increasing literacy around the world. Have you any idea as to how many people learn to read today, every week? Let me give you the answer. Every seven days, no less than three million people learn to read for the very first time. That never happened in the days of your fathers. It never happened in all the 6,000 years of man's history upon earth. It never happened until your day and my day. But in our day, no less than three million people learn to read for the first time every week, every seven days. Years ago, when I traveled around the world as a young minister, I found very few people who could read. Now, wherever I go, I find that education is compulsory. All over Africa, I find that education is compulsory. All over India, education is now compulsory. All over South America and all over Indonesia, education is now compulsory. And the result is that three million people learn to read for the very first time every seven days. But what are they going to read? It depends upon who gets there first. They read anything they get their hands on. They're eager for reading material. Let me tell you something. The communists have the answer. Do you know that last year the communists printed two pieces of literature for every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl on the face of this earth? What other nation has done that? No other nation in the world has done it. But the communists have done it. They even boast of having taken China by means of the printed page. For 25 years before the Russian Revolution, 1917, they poured their literature into Russia. The other day, Gandhi's grandson, Gandhi of India, Gandhi's grandson said this, he made a statement, a statement that shook me to my foundations. Gandhi's grandson said, the missionaries taught us to read, but the communists gave us the books. Why didn't the missionaries give them the books? Because the churches that had sent out the missionaries had never caught the vision. And after spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to enable their missionaries to teach the peoples of the world to read, they allowed the communists to come along and supply the reading material. The missionaries taught us to read, but the communists gave us the books. Some time ago, the United Nations gave us the number of books, different titles, published by five of the leading nations of the world. Which nation do you think came first? Russia came first with 60,000 different titles. 60,000. And which nation do you think came second? The most educated nation on the face of the earth. Japan came second with 24,000 different titles. Great Britain came third with 19,000. India came fourth with 18,000. Which nation do you think came fifth and last? The United States of America. 
Do you know how many different books the United States printed last year? How many different titles? Just 12,000. Which nation believes in the power of the printed page? The United States with 12,000 books or Russia with 60,000. Do you know how many books Russia translated last year? Last year, Russia translated 5,000 different books. How many did the United States translate? The United States translated 800. How many did Great Britain translate? Great Britain translated 600. Again, I ask my question. Which nation believes in the power, in the influence, in the effect of the printed page? Great Britain with 600 translations, the United States with 800, or Russia with 5,000? Yes, the communists had the answer. They know the value of the printed page. And let me tell you something. The communists do not print cheap literature. Look at this magazine, if you will. Here's a magazine published by Russia. You can buy that magazine on almost any worthwhile newsstand in the United States. I was holding a convention in the state of Arkansas, way in the very heart of America, and I was able to buy one of these magazines in the English language. What is the purpose of this magazine? To win the minds of men for communism. Russia doesn't want a war. The worst thing that could ever happen to Russia would be to have a nuclear war. Russia knows that she, she would be annihilated in a matter of hours if a nuclear war were to break out. But if Russia can place this magazine which paints a rosy picture of communism into the hands of the professors in our universities and colleges, into the hands of our politicians and, and leaders and statesmen, into the hands of our liberal clergy, and win them to communism so that they'll be willing for coexistence, not, really, not realizing that coexistence is not the goal of communism, it's only a step on the way to the goal. The goal is world conquest. If they can win the intellectuals of the Western world by means of their literature, they may be able to take over someday without a war. Well, you say it can't happen here. That's what they tell me in the United States. It can't happen here. Then my mind goes back to Europe. And I remember that when I was traveling through Europe holding campaigns, I remember I came at last to Latvia. And after preaching for years in Latvia, I remember I went at last to the government. And I talked to the government officials. And I said to them, keep your eyes on Russia. Watch the Russian armies. Someday they may march in and take over Latvia. You know what they did? They laughed at me. I don't need to tell you what has happened. I left Europe. I came back to my own country, Canada. And now, all of Estonia, all of Latvia, all of Lithuania, all of Poland, all of Czechoslovakia, all of Hungary, all of Podkarpatska Rus, and all those other European countries where they said it can't happen here, they're all under the heel of communism. Every one of them, they're governed by communism today. And so when Americans say to me, it can't happen here, my mind goes back to Europe. And I remember that that's what they said over in Europe when I was there. And I remember that it did happen over there. And I've known God to use godless nations to punish his own people. And only God knows what's going to happen to America. Only God knows whether or not America is facing judgment. I believe that America is facing today either judgment or revival. And if America does not experience revival, America may be compelled to experience judgment. For I want to tell you, America has sunk just about as low as a country can sink, can sink in morals, in lawlessness, in violence, in brutality. America is ripe for judgment. And I wonder what about, what about the other countries of the world? I wonder if they're not facing the same situation. 
I wonder if my own country, Canada, isn't facing the same situation. I wonder if Great Britain isn't facing the same situation. I don't know about conditions in Australia, but you know something about them. And I just wonder, as I ask the question, it could happen here. And if you, are, if you and I are not on our guard, it may happen here. Do you know that I never read a word in this magazine about the concentration camps where 20 million slaves are being worked to death, not a word. I don't read a word in this magazine about the secret police who break into your home during the midnight hours and drag you off to prison and to death, not a word. I don't read a word in this magazine about the thousands who are trying so desperately to escape from East Germany to West Germany, not a word. This magazine paints a rosy picture of communism and they know exactly how to win the minds of men. And I can find this magazine in almost any country in which I travel, in the language of the people. And in many countries, it's given away absolutely free of charge, tons upon tons, in order to win the peoples of those countries for communism. The communists know the value of the printed page. Let me make a statement that I think should shake you to your foundations. Do you know? Do you know that every time the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ worldwide spends one dollar for the getting out of the gospel by means of the printed page, the communists spend six hundred dollars. Put those figures in your minds. Every time the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ spends one dollar for the getting out of the gospel by means of the printed page, the communists spend $600. That's how much they believe in the value of the printed page. Church hasn't awakened yet. Church hasn't been aroused yet. We're not beginning to realize what can be done by means of the printed page. And yet all we have to do is to think of what that book has done. Here's the printed page. Think of the influence of this book on civilization. Think of what this book has done for the Western world. Think of what this book has done for Great Britain. Think of what it has done for America. Think of what it has done for Australia. If you just stop and think for a few moments, you'll realize that the printed page has been God's method all down through the centuries for the getting out of his message so that men might turn to him and live. Yes, the communists have the answer. Let me... Let me tell you something else, believe it or not. The false cults are on the job. I don't know whether you have the false cults in Australia. I don't know whether you have Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia. But we certainly have them in Canada. And we certainly have them in the United States. Do you know that Jehovah's Witnesses had the largest religious printing press in the world? Now, why is it that the Church of Jesus Christ doesn't have the largest? Why should one of the cults have the largest? Do you know how many magazines that press produces every minute? Every 60 seconds, that one press produces 500 magazines. It runs day and night. 84 million in a single year. And that's one press, and there are scores of others like it. Getting out the message of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now you ask me the question, does it pay? Does it really pay to go from door to door? Does it pay to go from family to family? Does it pay to go from house to house? Let me give you an illustration. Did you read about the great evangelistic campaign that was held by Billy Graham in New York City in Madison Square Garden a number of years ago? I helped Billy Graham with that campaign. I was there with him on the platform day by day. Every day, Billy and I sat on that platform. We looked into the faces of 18,500 people. Every night, without a single exception, 18,500. One day, we were sitting there side by side, looking at that great audience. Billy leaned over, the song service was going on. Billy leaned over whispered in my ear, Dr. Smith, he said, 
Would you mind bringing the message first of all today? And I turned and looked at him. I said, Billy, if you want me to preach first, I'll be glad to do it. A little while later, I was standing before that great audience in Madison Square Garden, New York, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Billy was sitting on my left, listening to every word I was uttering. But if you followed the history of that campaign, you will remember that we left Madison Square Garden. And you will remember that we went to Yankee Stadium. Never to my dying day will I forget sitting on the platform of Yankee Stadium with Billy Graham and with Richard Nixon, who was then the Vice President of the United States of America, and who has just now been nominated and may become the next President of the United States. I was sitting there with Billy Graham and Richard Nixon, and presently, Richard Nixon, the Vice President of the United States of America, turned to me and started talking to me about Canada. He was specially interested in the Bay of Quinte, and he asked me some questions about the Bay of Quinte in Canada. I found it intensely interesting to talk to the Vice President of the United States of America. Because, you see, my mind went back to that never-to-be-forgotten day when the great American evangelist Paul Rader was holding a campaign in the Church of the Open Door in Los Angeles, California, a church that seats 4,000 people, where I preached on many occasions. And one night, as Paul Rader gave the invitation, a young teenager got up out of his seat, walked down that long aisle, and stood there at the front, facing Paul Rader, and there made his decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that teenager was Richard Nixon, who may be the next president of the United States of America. And I believe Richard Nixon is a Christian. He made his decision for Christ, and I thank God for it. Richard Nixon was called upon to give his testimony in Yankee Stadium. And facing 90,000 people, he gave his testimony. The largest audience I'd ever faced in all my life. 90,000 people. When it was all over, the benediction had been pronounced. Richard Nixon, Billy Graham and I walked side by side down through that enormous audience. And I can still see those people. 90,000 of them as they strained their necks to get a glimpse the Vice President of the United States of America. That's a scene that I'll never forget, never as long as I live. But a few months later, another service was held in Yankee Stadium. It was held by Jehovah's Witnesses. It was a baptismal service. And I hold in my hands here a leaf out of Life magazine showing Jehovah's Witnesses baptizing their converts. How many converts do you think they baptized at that one service? According to Life magazine, they baptized at that one service 7,136 converts. How many is your church baptized at one service? How many of all the churches of the world baptized? How many were baptized on the day of Pentecost? Less than half that number. It remained to Jehovah's Witnesses to baptize the largest number of converts ever baptized at one service in this 20th century. 7,136. And this is the point. Every convert was won by means of the printed page. Every one. Does it pay? Is it worthwhile? When I heard that, I asked myself this question. I said, why is it that we're baptizing dozens while they're baptizing thousands? What's the explanation? Why should they be baptizing thousands while we're only baptizing dozens? And I think God gave me an answer. Do you know, for 150 years now, more or less, the Church of Jesus Christ has been investing its money to a greater or less degree in bricks and mortar. 
in the building of new church buildings, in educational buildings of one kind or another, while Jehovah's Witnesses have been investing their money in their message. And listen to me. God never told us to build magnificent cathedrals and then invite the people to come in and listen to us. God told us to go out with the message. And that's what we failed to do. And that's why we have organized our entire congregation in the People's Church, Toronto, into a visitation committee. And that's why we send them out two by two to every house, and every family, and every apartment, every Jewish family, every Protestant family, every Roman Catholic family, every family of atheists. And they go out two by two with our gospel literature within one mile of the church. For we feel we're responsible for every family living within a mile of our church. And we see to it that our congregation gets out and visits those people and gives them the message of God's salvation and invites them to come to the church and hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. God is not pleased when we build magnificent cathedrals. It's the message that is dynamite. It's the message that does the execution. It's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And whether it's preached or whether it's read, it does the work. It brings about the results. I'm not against building churches. Don't misunderstand me. I built two large churches in my lifetime. I built one over 30 years ago, seating 1,800 people, and then built another one six years ago, our present church, seating 2,500 people. I'm not against building churches. But listen, I do not believe that God is pleased when we build cathedrals. I do not believe he is pleased when we build show places for tourists. I do not believe he is pleased when we build monuments for architects. I believe our churches should be plain, inexpensive, large enough for our work, but I believe they should be workshops for the getting out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe we should put our money into the message rather than into the building. Some time ago, the National Council of Churches of New York City, with which I have no sympathy, gave us some figures that I've never forgotten. The number of churches, the number of new churches built in the United States of America during the last year. Have you any idea how many were built? According to the National Council of Churches of New York City, there were built in the United States of America last year no less than 6,000 brand new churches at a cost of $1 billion. And when I heard that, I said to myself, I wish I could somehow stop this building program for just 12 months and put that billion dollars into the message. If I could put that billion dollars into the message, I believe I could guarantee the evangelization of the world in my generation. How much is a billion dollars? Now in Canada, we do not talk in billions. We do not know anything about billions. It's only when I go to the United States that I pick up the newspapers and read about billions. Let me give you some ideas to how much a billion dollars represents. Suppose I should be holding in my hands here a $20 bill. I do not know whether or not you have $20 bills, but we have $20 bills in Canada, we have $20 bills in the United States. Suppose I should be holding in my hands a great number of $20 bills. And suppose every minute, every 60 seconds, suppose I should toss a $20 bill over this pulpit onto the floor here in front of me. One $20 bill 
every 60 seconds. How long do you think you'd have to sit here and watch me to see me toss over a billion dollars? Can you give me the answer? Some of you look a little perplexed. Don't exercise your mind too much. It might be too much for you. Let me give you the answer. You would have to sit here for a little longer than 95 years. And I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> I do not leave for one single moment that I'm going to live for another 95 years. But that gives you some idea as to the amount of money that was put into new church buildings in one year. We can get a billion dollars for new church buildings. We cannot get a billion dollars for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. How much have you ever invested in the printed page? How much have you ever invested in paper missionaries? You put your money back of flesh and blood missionaries. How much have you ever invested in getting the gospel out by means of the printed page? The most effective method that there is today. How much? A billion dollars for new church buildings. And no possibility of a billion dollars for the gospel. Some time ago, the leader of all Christian work in Poland got through the Iron Curtain, reached the United States, came to my country, sat in my study in Toronto in the People's Church. Now I know Poland. I have preached again and again all over Poland. Thousands upon thousands of people know me in Poland. I preached extensively in Poland. I was there before the country was taken over by the communists. I turned to this leader. I said, tell me, how many churches are still open in Poland now that communism has taken over? To my amazement, he answered, there are still 280 churches holding services in Poland, 280. I was amazed. Well, I said, how can I help? What can I do? What is your greatest need? Without a moment's hesitation came the answer, literature. Literature. I said, literature, what do you mean? Well, he said, we haven't hardly any Bibles left. They're nearly all worn out. And the communists will not allow us to print new Bibles. And you can't ship any through the Iron Curtain. And he said, we have hardly any hymn books left. They're nearly all worn out. And the communists will not allow us to print new hymn books. And we haven't one single Sunday school paper for our children anywhere in Poland. The communists will not permit us to print Sunday school papers. But I said, what can I do? He said, that book of yours, the country I love best, that makes the way of salvation so clear, so plain, that book that has been translated into some 60 different languages. If we could translate into Polish, and then if by a miracle we could get permission to have it printed on the presses of the communists in Warsaw, Poland, it would be a godsend to our people. The members of our 280 churches would take it and they would distribute it secretly throughout the length and breadth of Poland. And thus we might be able to evangelize the entire country. I said, why don't you do it? Well, he said, first of all, we do not have the money. Well, I said, suppose I cross in the United States, and suppose I raise the money. I always go to the United States when I want money. <laughs> They're the most generous people on the face of the earth. They've never disappointed me in all these 40 years. Well, he said, we try it. I crossed to the United States. In a few days, I had the money. I sent it over to Poland. It got through the Iron Curtain. The committee received it. Then they start negotiating with the communist government. And every now and again, they would hold this American money up before the communist officials. And they would say, we'll give you this money if you'll print Dr. Smith's book. After more than six months of negotiations, the communists fell for it. They agreed to accept the money and to print the book. And there it is. That copy came through the Iron Curtain. 
This paper that you're looking at is communist paper. This printing that you're looking at is the workmanship of communist printers. They printed 20,000 copies. The largest number of any book of any kind or description in the history of Poland since communism took over. Then the Christians started distributing it. You see, I do not write off a country because it's gone behind the Iron Curtain. If I cannot send missionaries in, I may be able to send the gospel in. And it's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. I believe God Almighty will hold me responsible. I may be the only man who has this opportunity. And as long as the door remains open, I'm going to order edition after edition, as fast as the money comes in, so that the whole of Poland can be evangelized by means of the printed page. About ten months ago, I received a letter from the leader of all Christian work in Poland with a communist stamp on it, saying, Dr. Smith, every copy has been distributed. We haven't a single copy left. Could you not raise the money for a second edition? I wrote back by airmail. I said, you start negotiating with the communist rulers, and the very moment they give you permission for a second edition, you notify me, and even if I have to borrow the money, I'll send it over. About five or six months ago, I received another letter from this leader. He said, we have been negotiating with the communist rulers. Now we have permission for a second edition of 7,000 copies. Immediately I sent the money over. A second edition was printed. And this copy that I hold in my hand is a copy of that second edition. And now that edition is being distributed by the Christians. And any day now, any day now, I'm expecting another letter from Poland saying the last copy of the second edition has been distributed. Can you not send us money for a third edition? And I'm going to authorize a third edition just as soon as they get, can get permission from the communist government. For there is no other way to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to the peoples behind the Iron Curtain except by means of the printed page. And now we're going to be able to get the message into Yugoslavia. And we're also going to be able to get the message into Romania. And thus, we're reaching the peoples who are living behind the Iron Curtain with the gospel of Jesus Christ as fast as the money comes in. That book of mine, the country I love best, and then that other one for Christians, the man God uses, those books are now in some 70 different languages. I expect to have them in a hundred languages by the end of next year. And that's what I'm giving my time to now. As I travel through the United States of America, the Dominion of Canada, as I travel through Australia, holding meetings, every cent I get is going in to my foreign literature fund. I want to be ready to print a third edition for those Iron Curtain countries just as soon as the demand reaches me. I want to see that those books are in 100 languages by the end of next year. I can only speak to one congregation at a time. My books can speak to hundreds of congregations. They can go all over the world in all these languages and reach people that I'll never even see in this life. I take nothing for myself. For years now I haven't accepted a single cent as I've traveled around from place to place holding crusades, conventions, meetings. Everything I get goes directly for the getting out of this literature in other languages. My foreign literature fund. And I understand from your pastor that he is going to take up an offering tonight for this purpose. An offering that is going to go into my foreign literature fund. And you are going to make possible another edition of this book in the Polish language 
and in other languages throughout the world. For I'll be able to take that money, whatever you may feel led to give, and I'll be able to put it back the public back of the publication of these books in these different languages throughout the entire world. We must do it. I haven't much time left. I've already preached for over half a century. My ministry is drawing to a close. I'll soon reach the terminal. If I'm going to multiply my ministry, the only way I can multiply it is by means of the printed page. And that's why I'm concentrating on the printed page today as never, never before. Do you remember the last world war? France had fallen. The United States had not yet come in. Great Britain was standing alone with their back against the wall, expecting almost instant invasion. I was driving along the highway with my wife. I drew my car to the side of the road. I turned off the engine. So Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, was going to speak directly to the American people. I didn't want to miss a word. I tuned in London, England. The Prime Minister only spoke for two or three minutes. But I'll never to my dying day forget what he said. Speaking directly to the American people, Sir Winston Churchill said this, Give us the tools and we'll finish the job. And ever since then, I've been facing congregations of all denominations and speaking on behalf of our 44,000 Protestant missionaries, I've been saying to those congregations, give us the tools and we'll finish the job. And tonight, tonight, speaking on behalf of foreign literature, I say to you, give us the tools and we'll finish the job. Is it not amazing, dear friends, that God is giving us the opportunity of being a blessing behind the Iron Curtain? We rejoice when God gives us the opportunity to be a blessing in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, in Africa, in India. And I do not know that the opportunity has ever been given to Christians in Adelaide to be a blessing to folk behind the Iron Curtain before. Have you ever had that opportunity before? To be a blessing to folk behind the Iron Curtain. Personally, I've never ever had that opportunity to be a blessing to dear folk like that. We count it a privilege tonight to be able to give this offering to Dr. Smith on behalf of these people. I want to make it clear that we in the Southern Christian Fellowship will not benefit from it in any way whatsoever. Not in any way whatsoever. And in a few moments, we're going to have a word of prayer and we're going to commit one another to the Lord, this offering to the Lord, and these people to the Lord. And then our instrumentalists will play while we take up this offering for the benefit of these dear men and women behind the Iron Curtain. And there are many in this building tonight, as I look around, I know dear friends of mine, friends of ours here, who come from behind the Iron Curtain. Some of them have found Christ out here, of course. Shall we bow for a moment of prayer?